Uh, I heard you there. Speak there, Michael. I'm just seeing if I could pipe YouTube out uh, back through so I could play some elevator music. Uh, in that case, it's okay that it didn't work. It's okay that it didn't work. Yeah, but <laughs> you know, girl from Ipanema, Ipanema is apparently the canonical air, air, elevator music. Not sure. I'm glad to know that, but okay. Yeah, uh, apparently it's it's in all the movies. Whenever they're standing in an elevator, they that's what they play. All right. So, Militia, is your audio up and running? Um, uh, can you hear me? Can you confirm that you, he you can hear me? We can hear you. That sounds good. Thank you. OK, perfect. All right, we'll give it uh, um, the traditional extra minute or two. I don't know that we have two hours worth of discussion this morning, or this afternoon, or this evening, wherever you are. So we'll start at uh, two going on for three past the hour. Now it does work for me. I hit reload by mistake. Okay, I guess it's three minutes past, so assuming we're all ready to rock and roll, we should start. So again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, welcome to the ITF 109 Lake Working Group meeting. My name is Stephen Farrell. I'm one of your chairs and militia. It is muted, but is another one of your chairs. Yes, this is Melissa. Hello, everyone. Great. Uh, so we have the, uh, let me just go over here. So you can see the working group charter, link to the mailing list, Jabber room, if you're in Jabber otherwise than in Medeco, Medeco link, and the Etherpad, uh, for where meeting notes can be collaboratively taken and Michael has Michael Richardson has volunteered to take notes in the pad Michael is that correct pad yes excellent thank you uh, and with that all right we have the note well it's I guess the first time this week you'll be seeing this for some of you at least um, it's a reminder that IETF policies apply this it, this slide itself is not those policies. You should go read those. Uh, but by participating, you agree to these policies. Here's our agenda. Uh, we're at point zero. We'll be talking, John will be talking about uh, ad hoc and the issues 
we have with that, and then Francesca has a slot afterwards, and then we have one AOB item, uh, which I think was also John, was it Malicia? I, sorry, I don't recall right now. Uh, this is Garan. Oh, Garan, sorry. Um, so we have yeah. one AOB item at the end, uh, which is to discuss relationship with Kose and so on. So with that, does anybody want to bash the agenda some? Now's the time if you want to add something or tell us something about the agenda. So let's just add in the minutes that for AO, in the AOB slot, we will discuss the late related work at the IOTF uh, 109, and this will be led by Yoran. Great, thank you. Uh, so, assuming that means that we have nothing else in the agenda, um, I did have one piece of administrative to check, and we'll, we'll go to the list with this as well. Um, I just wanted to note that there's been a bunch of discussion in the GitHub repo issues, uh, which is a fine thing and, and something that's entirely okay for a working group to do. Uh, but it, you know, for some people, it suits them well to work that way, for other people, less well. So I just wanted to check uh, if anybody has a problem with that or if everybody's okay with it. And again, we'll confirm this on the list that we, we, there's a kind of process for saying that discussion in on GitHub issues is a fine thing to do. It does mean, of course, that anything substantive gets brought to the mailing list. But uh, if that's a thing somebody has a comment on or wants to talk about now is a good time. Um, I just um, wanted to request the chairs to, there's a config you can do that will send a summary, like a weekly summary to the list. I don't know how to do it, but it's possible. And it's in the GitHub RFC somewhere. Sure, uh, we can try to, I, I've seen those in other working groups and I find them useless myself, but if people want it, sure, we can do that. Uh, I, I find that it's useful for the simple reason that it goes in the archives it links back to the issues which are now closed. And so when you go back to the archives to find out what happened, you see that message and you're like, oh, the discussion was over there. And that's why you didn't find it in the archive. Fair point. Okay, so we'll take an action for one of the chairs to tweak that button in GitHub somehow. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll bring this up on the list with a, a pointer to the right reference for uh in the, the git working group that they have a document about this so we'll bring that to the list shortly okay so with that i think that's our administrivia and i believe uh this is the correct next slide please correct me if i'm wrong yeah uh so this is the slide set for the next two points one and two Great, and with that, I shall mute and let you run away, John. Uh, thank you. Uh, by by the way, do we have should do people raise hands or they just talk or when they want to say something? Uh, you, you, people can raise their hands inside of uh, Meet Echo, um, but I guess if you if you give people a chance and say. You know, now's, now's a good time to ask questions uh, as you go through the few slides. That would be fine, too. Yeah. Good. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Mm. Uh, so this is point one on the agenda. Changes. And there has been two versions since the last ITF meeting, 108. Uh, the changes from 00 to 01 was uh, removal of the PSK method, because it was agreed that the asymmetric method was fast enough, and there was basically no difference in message size. Then there's removal of examples with certificate by value, and some editorial changes. And then changes from 01 to 02, which was submitted two weeks ago, also not so many changes. Uh, it was requested to have a use of ad hoc section in the beginning to better describe the use cases. This came from the people doing formal verification. Then uh, there's a new subsection added and more text in line to uh, clarify the encoding of the bit string identifiers. 
uh, there was comments on people looking at the test vectors and so on uh, questioning if it was correct so now a lot more clarification has been added uh, then there's text added on what an identity is and what a small set of identities can be in practice uh, there's new text on um, and also that was requested by the people doing formal verification then added text on key confirmation and there's a, now a recommendation that the responder had have received explicit key confirmation of the key prk 43m before storing the long key material long term uh, can still send messages but should probably have key confirmation before storing it and these identities and key confirmation will we will come back to in the issues then there is test vectors for static dv hellman previous version only had test vectors for signatures and i think francesca will talk more about test vectors in her presentation about interop and then there is editorial changes so any comments on that Um, Joran here, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah just wanted to add that we'd started uh, the, this uh, new se subsection on bitstring identifiers. There was still some some confusion around that. So Steven uh, uh, Ristisov has provided feedback and we're we're trying to make it even more clear what, what's the purpose of this. And maybe you should say a few words about that. Okay, yeah, I have not seen that discussion yeah that's good um just point out that bitstring the encoding of bitstring identifier is absolutely needed it's like saves four bytes which is essential to get it to fit in LoRaWAN and um, five hop 60 -ish. unless there are any more comments i guess we go to the next part on the agenda uh, so the the rest of the presentation are is open issues and uh, most of them are uh, quite old uh, but there was now with the latest mails it has increased the discussion on github which is great it has also spawned some new issues um, so my plan is to go through them uh, one by one and allow all the discussion we need to have on them. And if we don't have time with all of them, I would suggest that we have an interim meeting somewhere after this meeting. Uh, I don't know if somebody wants some other order, we can fix this but otherwise i plan to go through them according to this order and there's one or several slides per per issue or issue group so some of these consist of several issues and some of these issues are also related so otherwise I, unless there is any comments I think we move on to agreement and negotiation. Uh, so agreement and negotiation of parameters. This is issue 11 and 23. And this is more a uh, uh, check that we, to so that this has been properly discussed and agreed. Otherwise, this is not part of some this is more just how things happen to be as the uh, protocol was built so you could consider other options here but basically ad hoc has several options and parameters the documents state that some of them must be agreed beforehand like the method 
the transport and correlation, and the use and format of the auxiliary data. Uh, the cipher suits, they are negotiated or verified. And then there are some cozy parameters, namely the how to identify the credentials and how to structure the identifier that are on the fly chosen by the participants. And all of these have different trade-offs. Agreeing beforehand of course, reduces flexibility, but of course, make sure that it's a very easy solution. Negotiation in might increase messy sizes and round trips. Uh, letting the parties choose things inside the protocols uh, al may allow an on-path attacker to uh, to deduce things from the message site and block things. Uh, and also, you might run into problem where something is not supported. And the discussion on GitHub so far is a comment that uh, people, uh, that person was happy with the current configuration. Okay, um, let's see. See TLS there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, any comments on agreement negotiation? Uh, maybe one comment from from me, Joran. That uh, I mean, when when it's stated here that the parameters agreed beforehand, it's uh, basically understood that the initiator decides and and the responder. Uh, so sort of de declines if it if it can't support. So it's basically the, it's a very crude no negotiation, but it's still it's still in principle possible that uh, initiator and responder support support different methods, uh, and the initiator uh, decides with message one which method is going to be. That was just a clarification. Oh, yeah. Michael is in the queue. My suggestion is that maybe we should add a um, appendix with an example such that someone who is invoking ad hoc in their protocol will be informed that the following parameters must be agreed on beforehand. In other words, you better put them in your document that uses ad hoc uh, as, as to what you intend to do for those. Um, and uh, so that people don't forget something as a kind of a um, proto applicability statement block, maybe. Also, as we add things or subtract things or to change our mind, then at least we'll know what, what we've, we're supposed to say. I, I don't think we're going to change our mind a lot, but it could be. Yeah, uh, that sounds like a good idea. I think. I think it is mentioned, but it's probably a little bit spread out in the document. So having a easy to find list is probably a very good idea. Um, unless there are any more comments, I assume we have the working assumption that this stays as is, but keep the GitHub issue open for some more time. Yes, that sounds like a good plan. Let's add as an action point that essentially we add a, a subsection on uh, clarifying what these uh, negotiated parameters, uh, negotiated and agreed parameters are before to add this in the draft. Mm. And I guess we can go to the next slide. So 
rekeying os of Oscor A80. This might uh, suggest is basically that this is not ad hoc, but this has been discussed. In, it was this was brought up in the Lake Working Group, and there's a choice to do this in ad hoc or Oscor. So, <clears throat> see if all these currently working on a document specifying equations to calculate AAD limits. Uh, you might have seen the document or the previous discussion on Lake when this was brought up or the discussion in TLS or Quick. And basically the equations let you uh, put limits on the number of encryption operations and the number of forgery attempts that you allow. So these are the different parties. It's uh, the client and the server have two different limits. And TLS, DTLS and Quick has adopted very strict limits based on these equations. Uh, and but these the limits themselves are not following from the equations. There's a lot of assumptions. You, one assumption is what target probability you want um, for either to an attacker distinguishing the ciphertext from a random string or achieving a single forgery. Uh, the equations does not handle multiple forgeries. That's uh, much more complicated to calculate. Uh, another factor is packet length. So plain text plus additional data for integrity, only plain text for the confidentiality. Um, and here you get you can have higher limits if you have smaller messages and you accept a lower probability. Um, having strict limits here is not a problem at all if rekeying is easy. If rekeying is not easy, it might cause problems. So this is not these AAD limits is not at all a problem for ad hoc. Ad hoc used each key only once. It might be a problem for OSCORE. And rekeying for OSCORE can be done either in ad hoc or OSCORE. As an example, DTL is at the limit for CCM with a 16 byte tag, 2, 2 to the power of 23, and 2 to the power of 23.5. Uh, and Q is the confidentiality limit, and V is the forgery limit. Uh, DTLS also state that given the uh, uh, probability target for TLS, which was decided for TLS 103, I think, uh, you cannot get CCM 8 to work. And DTLS 103 states that CCM 8 must not be used unless you take additional safeguards. Uh, so I think my feelings here is that the IoT community should discuss more what reasonable limits for Q and V are for CCM8. CCM8 is very, very well used in the IoT community. And it's not <clears throat> clear that the TLS limits are uh, the ones that should apply to all other protocols. And also um, my suggestion and the author see is that this is better done in OSCORE and the core working group than in ad hoc. Comments, opinions? And this is on the agenda for the core working group on Friday. So you have Michael in the queue and, and then me in the queue. Good. So I, I guess I can't understand. Um, this is not specific to CCM8. It's just we use it a lot. There's lots of other algorithms that have limits where you must rekey it. Um, going back to 3DES does that. Um, 
So I don't understand, and everything else in detail in TLS and IPsec and all this stuff, we've always just had run the re, the keying the keying protocol again to rekey it. Uh, we've never done this at the so-called transport layer. Um, so I don't know why this would be different in uh, OS core and ad hoc um, there, and 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 I don't know if you're if it's really specific for CCM or that's just, we have some advice right now about that. Uh, I think the reason why you might start want to want, want to do things on the record layer or the OSCOR layer is that if, if you set this um, rekeying uh, period so short that it starts to get a problem to rerun the handshake, at least for co very constrained IoT devices. Um, and I think basically the, the equations here are not specific for CCM8. It's, I think they're quite generic for any algorithm with a 64 bit uh, tag. And if you then put the um, forgery probability uh, as, um, what is it, uh, low as, TLS uh, has done, then then basically you cannot use 64 byte tags basically, or it you get very, very frequent uh, rekeying, at least with the packet sizes that TLS, TTLS has calculated with, which is due to the power of 14 bytes. That wasn't, I, I understood all that, but that didn't tell me why we should do it in OS core rather than, uh, I didn't understand why, I mean, either way, right? It's going to involve the same crypto operations unless I don't understand. So I don't understand, I guess I don't don't know what would be the, the advantage of doing it in OS core. Ah, uh, yeah, no, no, it might not at all involve the same crypto operation. I think in, on the, ad hoc level everything is already done you can just if you want you can rerun ad hoc and that would solve the problem what you can do on the record layer is that you can do things without asymmetric crypto so one option is that you you have a master key and periodically you derive like you have the oscor master key and periodically you derive uh, send new sender key from that key. You can also hash the sender key periodically, which also gives you forward secrecy, or you can exchange new keys in the OSCOR level with PSK protection. So all of this you could do much, much, much more cheaper than read running ad hoc. So I, I, I'm assuming Michael's question is finished with, if not, jump back in, Michael. Uh, so I had a, a, just a comment or slash question. Uh, it, is it documented somewhere in a way that would be friendly for a developer of a, let's say, a small device that is going to be deployed for a long time? Um, well, I, I don't think that should be an ad hoc, probably. But is there text somewhere that such a developer could read and know what to do? Not right now. Right now, they would have to read the uh, CFR GAA delimits documents. And there's no reference to that from OSCOR. Uh, but uh, th that would presumably be the outcome of the core discussions. Okay, so as a suggestion, I think it, it, it would be good if somewhere there was a developer friendly reference here because a lot of people won't understand all these details and will either never change keys or change them all the time um so if somebody was happy to write some text like that that would be great and i'm sure if, if a home for it could be found somewhere probably yeah. not an could probably fit in some some text in ad hoc also this is quite this is quite related to other 
other reasons to do rekey and like getting forward or backward secrecy. So probably ad hoc should also have some section of recommendations for how often you should, uh, how long you should use your session keys or, or how often you should redo ad hoc. Okay, thanks. And then we have Ben in the queue. Point. Um, I'm roughly getting back to Michael's point uh, in terms of, you know, is this something specific to CCM8? Is this something specific to OSCOR or ad hoc? Um, and, like, yes, this is a, a fairly generic topic. I think the specific formulas and the specific limits are specific to CCM8. And I think that from a practical point of view, part of why we're going to be stuck doing it in OSCOR or maybe ad hoc as opposed to somewhere else is that DTLS and the TLS working group essentially feels like they can get away with saying, don't use CCM8. Uh, but I don't think that that would really fly if, if OSCOR said, don't use CCM8 because people are using it already and you know, telling them to not do that is not really going to be effective. So the the way that this analysis would sort of take form would presumably be to say well yes maybe we can accept a lower security you know attack success probability in some of these cases and maybe it depends on how strongly we care about the particular data in question um, but i think that probably oscor is going to have to you know look at the formulas and, and figure out what is actually appropriate for the IoT environments in order to say that we can use this. Um, and I think Michael was sort of talking and typing into the chat about how, yes, we shouldn't be rerunning ad hoc every time. And I agree that's the right way to go. I think John had also mentioned that. So my, my sense here is that probably OSCOR or maybe ad hoc is going to be stuck talking about CCM8 safety and when it's appropriate to use it and how. And I guess Michael jumped back in the queue, so presumably he wants to respond. Uh, okay, so Ben, so if I understand what you're telling me is that because the limits of CCM8 are quite low, um, that TLS is saying, we will solve this problem by just not using that algorithm. And that's simply not an option here. Um, right. That, that I get that right. Okay. So that's very interesting to, to understand. Um, so, um, so I don't know what that would mean if I, if I do DTLS to set up an OS core, OS core uh, context. Um, and then there was no way to, well, I guess you'd have to run a rekey algorithm there. So all I'm really saying, though, is that it just seems it seems bizarre to me to put a rekey, whether John suggested, no, we can do master keys and all sorts of other stuff. Well, it seems to me if we're going to do that, it should be an ad hoc, not an OS core. That's what I'm trying to say, really. OK. I don't care how um, I do it. Well, maybe I do care, but but it just seems to me that we should we should write that down in the key agreement process, not in the other part. Um, Unless there's some strong reason to do it another way, I don't understand why that would be. Uh, okay, I mean, I think it, it comes up in DTLS because DTLS is both the key exchange and the record protection algorithm. And I guess I had been seeing it as saying if, when you're using the record protection algorithm, you need to uh, do the, the key update mechanism, which is a in protocol message for DTLS uh, after however many records. And for ad hoc and OSCOR, we, of course, have the key agreements and the record protection in separate documents. And so it actually becomes more important to think about which one it's attached to in the documentation. I don't have a super strong opinion off the top of my head, so it's something to think about, at least. I think maybe keep it 
open and uh, see where the discussions in core on Friday is going. And probably this should be some information in both ad hoc and if needed, if there will be some update document to OSCORE, it should of course be there as well. Yeah, that certainly sounds reasonable. Yeah, Joran here. I, I just want to uh, remind you that we also need for OSCORE itself, assuming you're keying OSCORE with symmetric keys, you also need for that case to have instructions about how frequently you need to rekey and how to do it. So if we do it in OSCORE, then we solve it both for, for the case when you key it with asymmetric keys and with symmetric keys. But I agree with, with what's been stated here that we should have text in both documents explaining the problem. But I think the mechanism to solve it should be in OSCORE. Good. Um, any more comment on this or should we move to the next issue? It's a comment from Jonathan in the, in the oh. chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I, that's good. Now we only talked about, about the second um where to do the, i think the my i guess jonathan's comment here discuss about the uh, um, i i agree that lake would be a better place to have discussion about um, th this the crypto and security parts of th these equations and what they mean and um, this is not only OSCOR, I guess CCM8 is used in most constrained IoT, so it would be good to have a more general discussion about that. Okay, so I guess we should keep this one open and continue the discussion on GitHub before closing. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think uh, this should be, uh, this will probably not be closed in a while uh, if this is going to be discussed in core. So you'd like the next slide, John? Yeah, yes, please. Uh, so next point is uh, future proofing ad hoc. And this is uh, two different slides and two different issues. So let's start with issue number 19 is, shall we replace HKDF with a more general extract and expand to allow KMAC? Uh, so Basically, HMAC is, was designed and is needed to mitigate length extension weaknesses in MD5, SHA-1, SHA-2. And SHA-3 and SHAKE does not have this weakness. And therefore, NIST has standardized the more simple and efficient KMAC mode. Uh, currently, the ad hoc document says that you shall use HMAC in HKDF. Uh, but as has been also been suggested and discussed for the HPKE document in CFRG, uh, the suggestion is to specify ad hoc in terms of extract and expand instead of HKDF extract and expand. And then you use HMAC when the hash function is SHA2 and use KMAC when the hash function is shake and i 
already uh, sent a mail to um, CFRG yesterday and quickly got the response there from Hillary, um, who suggested the following uh, adaptation to KMAC for extract and expand and uh, could be discussed whether uh, it should include a context. Obviously, the HKDF use does not use a uh, context as specified, uh, but Hilary pointed out that KMAC could use a constack context. That's the KDF extraction and expansion. And uh, the comments on GitHub was, is positive that this is something we should probably do. I myself feel that there is, uh, we should do this to be open to not only KMAC, but also any future uh, KDFs that are specified. Um, and there is a question from Sean, how well widely implemented KMAC is. I don't really know. Shake is, I feel, is having quite, quite some implementation and growing. KMAC is basically, if you have Shake, you have KMAC. But uh, the KMAC specification is quite new, so I, I don't think, there's probably not many APIs, but you can, if you have Shake, you can very, very, very easily do it yourself. Uh, yes, the discussion in HPKA was uh, definitely the same thing. I think what they decided was that um, they did not mention KMAC, but uh, the document, uh, they made the document or the document was general in terms of extract and expand the author set. Any comments on this? Unless there any comment? Yep. I think there was some, one comment from from Tim in the in the issue tracker, which was basically supportive. Well, yeah, I, I think that was basically both from, from Peter and, and Timothy, there was yeah, there was good support and, and also with respect to implementation. So, so yes. Are you in the queue or? Malicia, I see Hello. you on the queue. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. I'm having a little issues with uh, with unmuting my mic. Sorry about that. So uh, essentially what I wanted to say, I want to ask John uh, that based on the understanding of this issue, adding KMAC would mean adding another element in the cipher suit with which we would be uh, increasing the complexity, right? So uh, no. I have a question. Uh, I have a question whether it's possible to do uh, HKDF with shake and what are the disadvantages of this? Yes, you you can use um, H, HMAC with shake. It requires, you, you need to run shake uh, double the amount of time basically. Uh, the plan was not to include this in register any shake KMAC cipher suits. As currently specified, you can use ad hoc with all the um, COSI algorithms uh, if you use a private uh, cipher suit. Uh, the plan was to, instead of having HKDF expand, to use expand and extract, and then have a line saying that if you have SHA2, then you use H. HMAC, HKDF, and if you have shake, then you use KMAC and give uh, give formulas like the ones here, how you do that. 
that will not be something people need to need to implement. Okay, I see. So essentially, you're saying if the if the hash if the hash function is shake, that by default we would be using KMAC, and yes. therefore not be adding it to the to the suite. Okay, I see. So we have uh, Stephen and Timothy in the queue. Yes. So on the is there any reason why the answer here should be different for ad hoc and HPKE? No. So I guess my suggestion in that case is if there's no reason for them to differ, we should probably have them the same or then find a reason otherwise. I I think I think one difference is that HPK was very far I actually commented on this a long time ago, but then the authors did not do anything. Then there was a comment now when they are very late in the process and they did not want to add any new formulas, but they said it was general. So I think the change is that the difference is that ad hoc is a lot earlier in the standardization process. So it, I would suggest to add like formulas like this into the draft to explain how how one would use KMAC. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess generally, I'm I'm you know adding adding more options for people to implement is not something that is that friendly towards implementers. But if that's the right thing to do, I guess. But. Uh, Tim? Timothy, uh, Timothy, did you want to say something? So there is an unmute button in the uh, in this in, in the upper left corner that you should hit. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was only wondering uh, if there was a substantial difference between uh, a Shake software implementation and uh, the SHA uh, software implementation. Um, and I don't know if anybody knows this. I guess not. Um, I, I can look it up maybe later. Comment on Michael's commentary. So, so both shot two and shake are currently uh, possible to use in Hedoc uh, as they are registered. Cozy algorithms. Okay, seems to be positive to 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 make the change from to extract and span similar to HPKE. Let's otherwise I think let's discuss more on GitHub, maybe and just, on. Yeah. just understanding Christian's comment here when he mm. says, ah. uh, "I understood it already be a choice of SHA2 with HKDF." Shake with KMAC and, and so on. So that, I mean, the, 
So the, the difference would be that if you decide to implement shake, uh, then, or if the Cypher suite says shake, then you need to have KMAC. And yeah, so the, yeah, and that's, well, it's a good question. Is that is that too complex um, thing to have? Uh, is it obvious, is it better that we stick to HKDF? I, I think the, the the idea is to decrease the complexity for somebody that in the future only wants to support Shake and not SHA2. Then you don't need to implement HMAC. Good point. Let's let's take it to the issues. So, so shake plus HMAC shake would not be a thing is what you're saying. Yes. Okay. And I think we're all on agreement with that. I think everyone's in agreement with that and, and maybe a surprise that that was even a consideration. Okay. Good. Then we... I guess the, the plan is to move ahead with this um, then. Uh, but let's discuss, let's keep the issue open on the, uh, GitHub. Let's move to the next slide maybe, unless there's any more. Uh, so this is a different issue under the future proofing ad hoc. Uh, so, um, ad hoc currently uses uh, elliptic curve Diffie Hellman both for key exchange and for authentication in one of the methods. Uh, and all the new PQC algorithms for from NIST is expected to be be specified as key encapsulation methods. Uh, therefore, it might be a good idea to specify ad hoc in terms of key encapsulation methods. So it's prepared to be used with future chem algorithms. Uh, for Diffie-Hellman, I think this would be a purely specification change, depending, uh, yeah, uh, depending a bit on exactly what you do. There was would definitely not be a change to message size. Uh, CFRD HPKE is def has done a great job of defining exact interfaces for both unauthenticated and unauthenticated chem. Uh, if you would use implement ad hoc variants of these interfaces, there would be no change to the implementations. If you want to follow the SEDO code in HPKE, then there would be uh, implementation changes, but not changes to message sizes. Uh, so the interfaces defined by HPKE is generate key pair. That's easy to understand. You generate the private and public key, then you have on the left side, you have the methods that would be needed for the signature method. So it's only key exchange. So NCAP takes a public key and generates a shared secret and encryption. And in the Diffie-Hellman case, the shared secret is g to the power of xy. And encryption is uh, the, the, the other, the new public key, basically g to the power of y. And then you have the D cap where you take encryption, which in the family is e to the power of Y, and you take your own secret key, which is X, and you get the same shared secret. In the Diffie Hellman case, you would need the authenticated end cap functions, where you, in addition to the ephemeral public key PKR, you also input your own secret static key. In ad hoc, the secret static key is called uh, R on the responder side and I on the initiator's side. Uh, and 
reading up about this after the issue was created, it seems very likely that future camps will adhere to the generate key pair end cap and d cap, but maybe not as clear that they would adhere to the CFRG HPK auth m cap auth d cap interfaces. Uh, seems to be an open research question at this time, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, a problem is that while the ephemeral key is only used one time in this auth end cap, inside the auth end cap uh, function, it basically needs to be done used twice for encapsulation, which does not necessarily work with all the PQC algorithms. Uh, comments on GitHub was generally positive, uh, but um, I think if we are sure that if this will lead to that, we can just plug in PQC algorithms, then I think this is a good thing to do. If we are unsure that that will work, then I think this is just making the document, uh, might make the document harder to understand for people that are used to elliptic curve if Hellman and not to key encapsulation methods. Um, I think maybe a way forward would be to ask CFRG for advice. Any comments on this? I don't think it's worth doing only for the key exchange if we cannot do it for the authenticated uh, NCAPs. So, so just just one comment that we in the requirements document for Lake we actually said that uh, public uh, that post quantum is out of scope. Um, so it doesn't mean that we don't have to take take it into account in this way, but uh, we are not uh, obliged to to support that in in this version of the of the document. Yeah, I think the plan is not to try to standardize any PQC algorithms that this time it's just to, if this is the future way authenticated uh, public key encryption and key exchange interfaces will look like, it might be a very good idea to adopt to that already day today. And the algorithms themselves will not necessarily need to specify these interfaces themselves, but they, it would be necessary that they can be made to work with the auth and cap, auth d cap interfaces. Um, if there's not any more comments, I suggest that I formulate a message to CFRG and uh, let's see what CFRG says about this. Could also formulate a mail to the NIST PQC standardization list. And then we could see, based on that, we can discuss this more. So, so uh, just a clarification question, uh, ignoring Post quantum. Is the proposal to make ad hoc APIs look more like HPKE? Yes. Or, okay. Uh, I, I think that sounds like a, quite a good idea because it seems that people seem to like the, the interface in HPKE. So. Mm. Yeah, I think the interface. Is, so uh, what you're saying is that it might be a good idea even if we don't are not sure that the PQ, future PQC algorithms will be a plug and play here. 
just the idea of adopting to HPKE is good. You, you, certainly, I mean, yeah, the the, mm. the APIs, the, the APIs that 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 it includes, people seem to like. So that seems like a reasonable idea. Mm. That's a good point. Would you then suggest just using the same API or using the said code also that um, HPKA are um, providing for auth end cap and auth D cap? I think that would be very possible to do, but it would definitely change the test vectors. I, I guess I'm neutral. Um, so, yeah. but I, 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 the more I like these things are, I guess that would that would help people implementing to some extent. But again, I'm neutral. So, yeah, but I think that might be that might be a, then you might be able to reuse HPKE implementation for this. So that would have uh, might have benefits. There's a comment by Tara here, which I didn't understand. Tara, would you like to take this this comment about the AD interface and how that applies here? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so I, I mean, IPsec and Secrecell and uh, so on, we had this issue with AAD algorithms because the early early days we have a separate, you know, authentication and separate encryption algorithm. It did cause some problems later when we, every now everything is AAD algorithms. For example, TLS, there was, uh, sorry, Secrecell, there was lots of issues with, because the interfaces don't really support the AAD algorithms that are used now don't really support the way that the Secrecell is doing things. So if we move things to use, you know, something that is probably going to be used by future algorithms, it knows also, it also makes so that we don't actually use any features that are not allowed by that. Sorry, could you, I, my phone just rang. Could you repeat what you, you said, I just heard you began talking about the ADAD and that it was good to adopt to that early. Was that the understanding? Yeah. So, so it would have been easier if you had adopted that in earlier in some other yeah. algorithm. Good. And because we didn't do that, we ended up problems when we then started, you know, start to form things in this way. And then we realize that, oh, we are doing some things that we can't actually do there with that framework. And mm. for example, the secure cell was having did that they actually encrypted the length, which means that before they can actually decode the packet, they have to, you know, decrypt the first, uh, first block before they can actually verify the hash and AAD algorithms doesn't allow that to be done very easily. Mm. And that kind of, we ended up in some issues there. Good. Um, Christian had a, a question here on the chat, how this would affect COSI APIs. We just use then HPK APIs rather than COSI APIs. That's, that's a good question, which I don't have an answer to right now, I think. Mm -hmm. So generally, I think the people are positively inclined to doing this change. 
Uh, yes. Does anyone object? I hear none, so I guess we should be doing this, John. Yeah, uh, let's have um, uh, the working assumption that we will do this. I think it requires a more uh, investigation how it will affect different things, and which will probably result in more discussion. But uh, let's move ahead with uh, with analyzing and trying to specify this. Sounds good. Okay. Next slide. Uh, so more ways to identify certificates, KID, C5U, and C5T. Uh, so these are two quite different, uh, two different issues. Um, so currently the assumption in the ad hoc document is that you use X5T or X5U. Uh, to identify a certificate, the X509 certificates. And if you're using a raw public key, that is identified with a kit, which the entities choose themselves. It's just a, a variable length byte string. Uh, COSI Working Group is planning to work on Seaboard certificate. Uh, it's in the draft charter, and that would very likely result in new identifiers for CBOR certificates. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, maybe sticking to, so basically the current X5T identifier as given an example here in the middle of the slide is at least 14 bytes when it's CBOR encoded. Uh, on the other hand, a KID identifier can be as small as one byte when it's encoded in ad hoc. So there's a quite large difference, and this might limit the use of certificates when compared to RPK and very constrained devices. Uh, but if a raw public key in ad hoc can be identified by a KID, a certi certificate should as well. There is no real differences. So the suggestion is to specify uh, how that certificates can be identified with a kit, which would lead to certificates by reference could be as small as RPK, making them fit in 51 byte Loravon and 5 hop 60 ish. Uh, the the other thing with COSI certificates would have to wait until and if uh, COSI working group has adopted uh, uh, work on CBOR certificates. I hope not everybody is having audio problem. Thanks, Steven. So, I, I, I agree that, you know, you can construct a situation where you could somehow identify your less than 256, or maybe it's even less than that of Seabor, when Seabor encoded, of um, raw public keys with one byte. Um, but of course, all the clients need to know which byte to send because it's arbitrary because you need to pack them there. Um, at, at which point, um, I think you've done so much work that you would have no use for using certificates anyway. You have such a small number of devices and you've touched them all uh, to, to tell them what key ID to use that there's not really a lot of point in trying to do this with certificate as well. I think the point of is when you're using a certificate is because you either have more devices or you just don't want to have to touch them to initialize that KID. So I just don't think it's a realistic kind of thing to, to say there. Um, and I'm sure you know the uh, auth 
the ace off oh, come on you're on how's it pronounced again that the document that we've been working on uh, which does reference certificates out of band um so i i don't think this is a terribly useful optimization in practice um that's my instinct So, Michael, uh, that's the ace ache authorization you were referring to, and I think I think that it actually can be useful in in the sense that you are not actually transporting the certificate. So, it still it still means that you need to understand what this byte or a few bytes mean. But not all devices will will need to have an encoding for all certificates. So it could still make sense to have just a few bytes identifiers instead of, well, 14 or whatever. So I agree that it's true that not all devices will need to understand all certificates. But I think Michael's point is that in order to use these very short identifiers, you need to tell the device which byte refers to which certificate and it's going to be different for each device uh, because as you said not all devices will need to know about all of the certificates and by the point that you are already giving a customized configuration to each device it seems like the the benefit from using a certificate as compared to if i understand correctly just a raw public key is very minimal uh, because you still have to manually give custom configuration to each device. And the general point for using certificates is that you don't have to give custom configuration. You can uh, have the PKI sort of relay the necessary information down. Um, would there be a benefit if devices does not need to support raw public key? Uh, raw public key and the self-signed certificate is basically the same. So if you want to use, if you might, maybe some implementation want to support PKI certificates and self-signed certificates and would not have to support a special, specific encoding for raw public keys. So, so um, on the device end, on the sender side, the device has to have access to its uh, private key to sign things, and it really has really has doesn't have any clue or care how the whether it's actually using a raw public key or a self signed certificate or a certificate. The device just signs with its private key, right? So there's not actually any code except for whether I initialize an X five T with some blob or a KID with some other blob. In either case. That blob is doesn't have to be interpreted or created. It doesn't have to speak ASN1 to do that. Um, it's the other end. It's the responder that has to do that. And if that other guy has got internet and it's not constrained, then it's less of an issue. So, so I don't see a difference between the two of them for the the constrained side of the set of the in, that device. Um, it's again like how do I put the right thing in? If if I've provisioned a certificate into the device somehow at the factory, then yeah, the device could actually, you know, figure out what to put into the X5T on its own, perhaps compressing it, etc. So maybe it does need some code, but again, that can be actually calculated ahead of time and put in the right place. So I, I don't, I don't see the advantage. And we've gone through raw public key, believing this is a panacea for IoT, and I don't, I don't really see it. I've never saw seen why it was a, a, a big deal. Um, Michael going in the other direction when the device is going to authenticate to a non-constrained network node it it would be a good thing if it doesn't have to send i mean it actually doesn't have to send anything right it, it could basically just point to a repo that, that would be and, and i mean provide an, an identifier and point to a repo so in that from case the, we, I mean, if, from, from the, the point of view direction the, to the to the yes. to the responder, yes, and we described yes. that so in, sending... the, in the ace ache off, right? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So sending from that point of view, sending fourteen bytes of hash doesn't add anything, right? 
No, no. And, and I think that the representation we got was better and, and had better privacy implications too. Um, although the fact that you have to point to the repo probably costs you around 14 bytes anyway. I mean, it could be seven or something if you really push it. Right, but. right. But then you don't need the additional um, hash of the, of the certificate. So, so having Agreed. a key identifier. In that situation, it would be useful, actually. Um, sure, it depends on how you construct the key identifier, right? Because it's got to be, if you have the pointer to the repo and you have the key identifier, then you either have to, someone has to decide what that, what that value is. And um, that's okay. But, but my point is that it's not going to be one byte. I think that was the point I was trying to get at, is that, that I don't think I don't think it's meaningful to to be able to say I can reduce it to one byte in this raw public key environment and wouldn't it be good to get certificates that, that small because I don't actually believe that one byte is a realistic uh, usable deployable situation. I think one byte is a, a lower uh, limit, but uh, hopefully the key ID could be smaller than fourteen bytes. Again. Yes, I agree, provided that you walk up to every device before you turn it on, plug in a cable or something and tell it which three byte at key ID identifier to use, right? I, I, some yeah. way you've got to tell it that thing, right? At which yeah. point you could just as well pull the certificate out uh, and have it use a raw public key and put that in your database because you've got to have a database to, to map the two things together, right? So. All I'm saying yes. is that all the cases where a certificate could be used with a very small identifier that's not derived from the certificate, then you could probably do raw public key anyway. Yeah, this is basically a alternative representation of a raw public key instead of a cozy key. Yeah. But again, we, Michael, we from the that. point of view, from the point of view of the, the device proving to the network, then it is a then the network would rather have a certificate than a public key. So in that case, it's an advantage more, from the point of view. It's more scalable to do that. And um, so if you can, I, 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 it's probably more scalable, um, but but most of the advantages of the, the certificate, which is like that you could change the public key or something like that, or you can re-sign it, or you can, you can put a CRL out saying that the thing has died, right? Um, yeah. All of that, you know, yeah, that may be useful. But again, as, as I'm trying to say, still got to go touch the device and I give it its its KID to use there. Sure. I, I think this has, works as an as at least as an option. It does. It's sort of. I don't see what it complicates to allow this. And if there are not so many use cases, or if they are the sort of the one touch type of scenarios, well, why not still have the option? Yeah, um, maybe continue this discussion on GitHub. So, comment from Steven that we are on slide eight of 22. Uh, so, um, and that we should prioritize what to discuss next. Is there any other somebody that my suggestion would be that we just uh, take the slides in order and then we and allow discussion on each as much as we need and then we move everything else to the to interim. Uh, is there anybody that wants to discuss any particular of the remaining issues? Then we could prioritize that issue. So we have discussed the first four bullets. There are nine bullets remaining. I, 
I, I think verification of intended peer is good, and we should probably get into the Cypher Suite um, SHA-512 um, and the forward-backward secrecy. So the last three ones is, I think we should discuss, and, and verification of intended peer. That's uh, and perhaps uh, the key confirmation delivery of receipt. Okay. Receipt from I, I don't think, think we have time at all to discuss these uh, in the same amount that we have discussed the first bullets. Would you then suggest that we take each of them very high level five minutes, which is not at all enough to discuss, for example, forward secrecy, I think, or the algorithms? Okay, perhaps perhaps you, your proposal was best. Let's 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 go through the issues in order and schedule another meeting if necessary. No, that would definitely be necessary. Any more comments? Otherwise, we move on to verification of intended peer, then resumption, then maybe error. That is probably the only thing we will have time to. Good. Uh, verification of intended peer. Uh, so this is something that was, we made some updates to the document in the last revision based on comments from the people doing formal verification uh, to better illustrate what's, what an identity was or a small set of identities are. Um, uh, and uh, so, so let's see. But uh, there was one comment was that maybe we should skip the identity concept uh, totally. Um, identity is in the Sigma protocol, which this is very tied to PKI and a person, which might or might not be applic applicable directly to IoT setting where you have devices and not persons and also, it's not clear that these devices or services inside devices have uh, identities in the same way as humans have names. Uh, sometimes uh, you might see the public key itself as an identity. Uh, ad hoc uh, have, when raw public keys are used in ad hoc, uh, ad hoc allows the parties to agree on an optional subject name, similar to the subject field in a certificate. And this subject name is included in the MAC signature, it's not sent on the wire. Uh, and this protects against attacks, as mentioned in the Sigma paper, where an attacker successfully register a pub succeeds in registering a public key with a different subject name uh, and then f fools you when you talk to the real owner of the public key then you would have a wrong subject name if you add the subject name that you think that you know in the mac then the connection would fail in such a situation uh, so the questions here is first is uh, I think the feedback has been that this is from the formal verification is that this is a very good idea. Uh, question is, will there always be a subject name uh, available? For example, the UI 64, should we recommend uh, to use a subject name with a raw public key? Should we even mandate using a subject name? Uh, but that depends if a subject name is always available, otherwise I think should not mandate that. Uh, the document would, authors would also want more feedback on from 
people operationally doing constrainerity, how they see identities, is the uh, is do they see the raw pub, the public key itself as the identity? Is the identities available like EUI sixty four and so on? And also uh, other question is should we should we use the word identity or should we only talk about raw public keys and subject names? When you talk with EUI 64, are you talking about binding it to the actual layer two or layer three address, or it's just something that they have? That's a good question, which I realized pretty recently and will bring up for discussion in COSI after this. I, my understanding now is that it's, it's, the the binding to a MAC address is deprecated by IEEE, and so that's not something you should do in the future. Um, and that the EUI sixty four and then is then uh, identity disconnected from the network layers. But uh, you probably know this better than I do. So comment from Michael that this is, seems like a needless complexity, seems to not want to, definitely not want to manage this. So discussions in the chat section. Maybe somebody, maybe somebody want to say something instead. I think there's several people in this group that has a lot of knowledge about EUI 64s. But suggestion here is that they need to think about this topic a bit more. So this document, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So. I think the 15.4 doesn't have any plans of doing any kind of, you know, uh, privacy addresses yet. So, so the L2 addresses uh, are going to be same. In most of the environments, what they are doing for there is actually doesn't matter. For some uh, cases, they actually they already do have the 16-bit, you know, uh, uh, these local address uh, the, the, or short addresses which they can use for, for example, if you have a already formed network for example your personal area network that could use the you know short addresses but it doesn't help that the, if somebody is there when you actually register or join the network then they can see the l2 addresses the full 64-bit addresses and i i have no idea that, i have no knowledge that the, anybody would be actually thinking about uh, doing any work on that chasing those Comment from Don indicating support of using public key as identity. Uh, 
uh, from uh, there was previously a lot of comments about identities in ad hoc from several TLS people. The authors would like to have subject name in raw public keys at least optional. Otherwise, uh, you don't protect against these attacks that Sigma try to uh, protect against. And if whether they are realistic in the IoT scenario or not can be discussed. And using the identity as seeing the public key as identity is definitely possible in the current specification. Any other? So I guess we should leave this open for discussion on the GitHub and move yeah, on. I think so. So next is resumption, and that's also a, a sanity check. So previously the protocol had resumption then it was decided to remove the PSK method, which also removed the resumption. But I, my understanding is that there was no real discussion whether to remove resumption or not. It just followed from removing the PSK. Uh, so this issue brings this up just to take a decision that we don't need resumption or that we need resumption. Uh, so, uh, is there a need for resumption? Uh, resumption allows you to minimize state if you don't know if you will ever see the other party again. You also get forward secrecy and freshness, but these you can probably get in a cheaper way. And IoT connections are long-lived, so typically having a resumption mechanism is probably an doing a new handshake probably cost more than not doing this. Uh, so my suggestion, and I think the comment on uh, GitHub is that resumption, we don't need a resumption method. Uh, any other uh, opinions regarding resumption or can we confirm that the ad hoc does not need a specific resumption method. Uh, this, some resumption could potentially follow from if we want to do some forward things for forward or backward secrets or something. But we don't define any resumption just because of resumption. Should I take the silence as a confirmation that we don't need resumption? Can you hear me, John? Yes. Uh, hi, this is Mohit. So I guess uh, if you're getting rid of the PSK, then maybe getting rid of resumption is a natural consequence. Because at least in DLS, the resumption is based on PSK. And since uh, ad hoc has chosen not to support PSKs, then I don't see like uh, I, I I don't have strong opinion. It's a little bit sad if you're going to lose resumption, but uh, I think this is natural consequence of then not supporting PSK mode. So yes and no. I think the decision was to not support PSK as an initial uh, authentication 
method, but um, as the resumption was using that like in TLS 1.3, it disappeared also. But um, you you say it's sad, but uh, is there any any re re use case? Like, I don't know where and like, uh, where all ad hoc will be used, hopefully in many places. And if later we find out that there is some people who do more frequent handshakes and don't want to uh, do the full uh, full handshake every time. Uh, but maybe in, in, in this case, the full handshake is not such a big uh, uh, performance uh, degradation that uh, performing a full handshake every time is not such a big issue. So yeah, I uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's fine uh, to get rid of it uh, in most situations. And if someone comes up later, then we will see it. But I can't think of some specific use case where we would need frequent uh, resumptions. Good, then I guess the assumption is that we we don't need resumption. Just, yeah, just, I think we should yep. um, we, we should consider what is coming out of the OSCO discussion of discussions about how we how we rekey and whether we can rekey inside OSCO. If that is turning out that if it's if the decision there is that we can rekey easily on the quote a record layer. Um, then um, we don't. They, then we don't get a requirement for assumption there. But if Oscar says that, yeah, please higher layer, pl do something for us, then resumption should still be an option. So I don't think we'll have to discuss much about this now. But we should keep the option open until we have a rekeying mechanism for Oscar. Yeah, I agree. Um... So should we move on to the next slide or is maybe the time is running out so we should instead move to Francesca and Joran or what does the share said says say? Uh, let's go for until uh, 45 past uh, okay. and then we can the slides uh, of Francesca and Joran and move on all the other on the all the pending issues to the interim meeting. Yep. Okay. Then next slide. I think you could go even to ten too. Uh, Francesca asked for one minute, and and I I can I can easily do with five minutes. So good. So next issue is distinguish error message, uh, and this was raised by a implementer. I maybe you I don't remember exactly who. But the question was, how do you distinguish that you get the error message and not a message two or three, or maybe even a, a new message one? And this is not really discussed in the draft. Uh, looking at here uh, on the CDDL for the two first elements, uh, you can notice that the error message has a text string as the first or second CBOR item in the sequence. So that can definitely be used to distinguish it from the other messages. Uh, question is, is this good enough for distinguishing or should we add something else? The well, message two is, for example, full. We should not add a single byte to that, but error message adding some bytes would not matter. Uh, irrespective of that, I think the draft should definitely add some text on how to distinguish the error message from the other messages. Uh, and I think it's only guidance on error message that is missing all the other messages you distinguish by the connection identifiers or by underlying properties of the underlying network layers. 
And I see there's a lot of discussion about identities in RPK. Oh, that's great. It's, let's uh, uh, summarize this in the GitHub. It would be very thankful. It would be great if the people writing this could also write something in the GitHub. I guess otherwise maybe someone else can summarize it. Any comments about distinguishing error message? Um, yeah, so my, take, hmm? my take on this would be that since we don't have any of the constraints on size in the error message, we might want to add an explicit identifier of the error message. Hmm. That sounds good. Maybe we can um, bounce it back to the peop the person implementing this. What they, how they, how would they l like this to l look like? If they have any preferences, and whatever we decide, I think we should have add guidance in the draft how you can do this. Um, And any more comments about adding an explicit identifier or relying on text string? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I was just wondering about what Malicia said. Do you mean an identifier for each, like, for like common types of errors, or like just an identifier saying this is an error message? And then, like the uh, the actual error message can be described inside the, the text string. I meant uh, I meant the letter the letter, so essentially okay, so just the error message. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with this. Okay. So if there are no other comments, I propose that we move on and take this on to GitHub. Yes. That sounds good. So this issue is about the encryption in message two. And this is the encryption of the ID cred R, the identifier for the credentials of R. And as discussed in Sig the Sigma paper, the responder sends its identity to anybody who asks. So an attacker, active attacker, can get ours identity. Uh, there is therefore no need to have in CCA encryption, i.e. encryption with integrity of this identity. It's enough to only have encryption in CPA encryption, encryption without integrity in this case. And just as a note, everything in the message is integrity protected by the inner Mac, uh, which is also an AAD without, it's an AAD without plain text. Uh, and a problem is that COSI only has AAD algorithms, so they all have a tag. And having a tag here makes this too big to fit in LoRaWAN 51 byte or 5 hop 60 ish. So that was the reason that uh, I think ad hoc two or three um, versions ago removed the integrity tag in message two on the outer uh, encryption because it had no purpose. And the specific ad hoc specification today, uh, the solution is that it generates a long encryption key 
and then form a SOAR cipher. It SOARs the long key with the plain text. Uh, and this has the benefit that it is independent of the encryption algorithm. Uh, but it uh, led to comments both from the people doing formal verification, which asked, why are you using source cipher? And they also said that they got comments from the reviewers of their paper saying, why is this using source cipher? Uh, which brings to this issue. Uh, so how should we do this encryption without integrity? So option one is to do like today. Option two would be to do an AAD and then remove the tag from the AAD. I think this works for the current COSA algorithms, but it, in general, it does not work uh, for an AAD that does not have a well-defined tag. There are some such algorithms, but none of them defined for COSI. Third option would to basically make a table where for each COSI AA the algorithm you assigned uh, encryption algorithm without integrity. So for CCM and GCM, you would use ASCTR, and for ChaCha Poly 1305, you use ChaCha. Um, and this have then the disadvantage that you need to specify something for if COSI specified a new AD80 algorithm. Um, and my feeling is that to fit in LoRaWAN and 6 we need to, we cannot introduce the integrity tag. Uh, again, it fills no purpose. And these are the three different solutions that I could come up with. They all have benefits and disadvantages. I think we have to choose one of these. I think Christian comment here about difference between two and three um, might be I might be some I don't know if you you have different nonces that depend maybe on CCM and GCM so maybe the encryption would not look ex exactly the same if you just remove the tag as if you would uh, specify ASCTR, but um, we'll need to look into that more in detail. Comment from Ben is to basically DTL is doing something similar to tree. Uh, and I guess Ben's suggestion would be to do uh, number three. And I think we can not use we cannot use ECB um, because it has too short block length. We would need to use CTR. Anybody want to say something about encryption or about babies? Sounds like 
everyone says we should just do number three. I don't know why there's a downside of that. No, the, the, I think that's the, the only downside is that you basically need a, a mapping. So if COSI specify a new algorithm, it might not follow directly, at least theoretically, it doesn't follow directly what you should use, but maybe in practice it follows anyway. It, it seems, would be good to have, yeah, go ahead. It seems to be a preference here for three. I don't have any strong opinions myself. Um, do we have any implementation input here on XOR versus counter mode? I suppose counter mode is should be fine. Yeah, I, having implemented, not really implemented the protocol, but test vectors, I think they are quite, both of them would be very easy to implement, I think. Okay, so I propose that we continue discussing this on the, on the GitHub page. Uh, and we stop here because it's already uh, nine till the hour. Yes, sounds good. And people are starting discussing babies instead, so it's a good breaking point. <laughs> yes. So I, I invite everyone to to comment on the GitHub issues uh, with the comments you might have in chat. And with that, uh, I would uh, we should move on to the next agenda item, which is the interrupt planning. So, Franz, uh, Steven, can you present the slides or? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you, Francesca. I'm also gonna share my... Hi, we see you, okay. So uh, this is just a quick, uh, um, I just want to quickly talk about implementation, interop, and test vector status right now. So next slide, please. Um, so in version 02, 02 of the draft, we have added one more test vector to, to the draft because we had uh, positive feedback about it. And so, I think I don't see the slides updating. I don't know if we're looking at uh, slide two. But the test vector in the do document. Keys and using the X5T hash value to identify the certificate. And then method three, which is ad hoc authenticated with static Diffie-Hellman keys and raw public keys encoded as COSI key with a key ID used to identify the credential. And we also have a way more extensive set of test vectors on GitHub at this link. And um, uh, yeah, implementers should be aware that these exist and that you can check them out. And um, the one in the document in Appendix B of the draft are actually, should give you more guidance about how things are built and, and, and constructed, but then the vectors in the, in the GitHub as well are, uh, um, yeah, should, should be used to, to test your implementation. And we also have test vector for error message uh, in progress. So next slide. Um, we are starting to think about interop. So we've uh, talked about, um, we have contacted several people uh, that, that showed interest and that showed that they had uh, uh, maybe some implementation available. And um, we are looking for more people to participate. So if you are planning to, 
uh, implement or you have an implementation and you're interested, please uh, let us know, write in the mailing list, contact us, and hopefully we can have something going for December, depending on availability of implementers as well. And, um, and we are also starting to think about the, uh, the test suite, uh, which will be based on the test vectors. Um, so yeah, we will keep everybody aware of this effort uh, in the lake mailing list, but if you want to um, uh, participate, it's also good if you come to us or write in the mailing list. And that's all I wanted to say. Okay, thanks Francesca. So uh, we should follow up on this, on the mailing list, definitely. This is an interesting topic. Uh, but since we are very close to the end of the meeting, I propose we move on with the slides that Joran uh, had prepared uh, on related work. Stephen, could you present that? Okay, let's see. Yes, here they are. Uh, Yaron, can you? Yep, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so yeah, this is just, uh, just information. Um, lake meeting is almost over, but there are more topics related to lake at this meeting. So the COSI meeting following right after the break will speak about uh, seaborne coding of X519 certificates and identification, as we mentioned. Uh, we discussed this previously. Um, it's not decided whether it's relevant or not, but uh, if you're interested, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the slot for, for that topic. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, there is a slot uh, in the core working group, looking at a draft for combining ad hoc, ad -hoc and S-core, uh, ad hoc and O-score in one message, and also in core, on Friday is the discussion about uh, rekeying, as was mentioned. There's also the ACE working group on Wednesday. Uh, the two drafts are related to how to use ad hoc for authorization, uh, to add authorization to ad hoc, and also to add certificate enrollment. And there is a charter discussion uh, where one of the topics for potential new work items is around uh, authorized access to raw public keys using the authorization framework. So that would be a way of, of kickstarting ad hoc. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So just, just for illustration, um, since I like colors, I, I put together this example uh, using the drafts of the, of the previous uh, slide and how how they could be combined this is just one example they are not really uh, you don't need to combine in this way uh, but so just a quickie on the colors here you can do ad hoc which is the blue oh this is an example about a device joining a network uh, assisted by an, a third party authorization server and also doing certificate enrollment uh, request and, and response so this is uh, this is what I think a little bit what Michael was mentioning, referring to. Um, we have the authentication in blue here. That's the ad hoc messages one, two, three. Uh, there are the black messages, uh, which is the OSCORE request response, and they contain uh, the EST payloads, uh, which are uh, in this case uh, it's a significant. Uh, this is a simple enrollment method, so it's the SEN. And it's the request is a CBOR encoded certificate signing request, and you get back a CBOR certificate or a reference there too, as described in this green uh, green reference. And the combination of OSCORE and ad hoc is that's the yellow box, and the third party optional third party assisted authorization is the red 
red blob. So I don't go through this in detail, but if you're interested, then go to the corresponding working group and and uh, have yeah raise your raise your opinion. So that that was it for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yaron. So just uh, before wrapping up, uh, we are on, on top of the hour, but I would just like to discuss the next steps. And since we did not cover all the issues in the today's meeting, uh, I propose that we have an interim meeting. So now the question is whether we would like to have the meeting before or after the holidays. So I welcome any comments. So Joran uh, would like a meeting before the holidays. Marco agrees with that. Do we have any other opinions? Michael agrees with that as well. So it seems we, uh, okay, and John, okay. So it seems we have consensus that uh, we should have an interim meeting before the holidays after the US Thanksgiving, as Michael proposes. So essentially beginning mid-December uh, from what I can gather. Uh, so let's make it, uh, let's make an action point for chairs to, to schedule this meeting uh, soonish. And with that, I would like to thank you for attending the today's meeting. I also thank Michael for note taking. And uh, so, Maybe put it just at the end of planned interrupt. So, okay, we still don't have a date on interrupt, Michael. So I wouldn't tie it to that, but uh, I will try to coordinate with Francesca and maybe uh, link the two together. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending. See you on the uh, for the rest of the week and talk to you on the mailing list and GitHub pages. Bye-bye.